Okay, welcome back to the Believe You Are a Good Mom podcast. Today I have Sue Groner with us. This is very exciting. Sue is a parenting expert. She is the parenting mentor on Instagram. <laughs> and so um, she has fantastic tips and um, and things on there. We were just talking. Uh, well, hold on. I'll let her introduce herself before <laughs> I get into <laughs> it. Sue, tell us more. Yeah, so I'm the parenting mentor, um, not just on Instagram, that's my website, theparentingmentor.com. And I started doing TikTok recently, too, because mm. I know that's what moms like their stuff. Um, and my goal really is to help parents be happier and more relaxed, kind of to learn strategies that will help reduce the everyday stress and anxiety that just inevitably comes from being a parent. Sure. You know, no one's exempt from that. Yeah. Well, and even just that is so good to remember, because I think sometimes we feel like an island or like we're the only one that's going through this. Like we take our kids to the drop off. And I just think about all my neighbors that are also <laughs> just went through the tornado of getting their kids up and ready and out the door. But we all just smile at each other like nothing's wrong. <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, and my I know morning that, was so easy. <laughs> right. And I know that 30 seconds ago, we were all losing our minds, you know, Yeah. but then we put on a happy face and pretend that didn't happen. And so I'd love to open this conversation and normalize how stressful it is to be a mom right? It, yes, it is. <laughs> um, and that's, and, you know, a part of that stress comes from the stories we tell ourselves, I think about what we have to do. Yes. You know, and, and to me, the, that starts with the really big picture of what our goals are as a parent, you know, and I think so many of us kind of just go to this place that I call, you know, engineering you know that and and I said parenting is not this 18 year engineering project mm -hmm. you know and by engineering I mean okay what are we what are what do we want for our kids you know we want them to excel in school we want them to excel on the stage we want them to excel in this field you know and and beat out the competition and you know it's all this like focus 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 on learning fast and doing well and working hard and we've kind of it doesn't work mm -hmm. you know you can't engineer a human being because mm -hmm. you're always going to be disappointed you know if things aren't going to work it's going to be frustrating not just for you but for your child when you're trying to get them to perform and be kind of kids that they don't necessarily want to be yeah you know maybe they don't want to play sports or they don't want to play an instrument or whatever it is maybe they're not you know type a or they're certainly not type a yet mm -hmm. and we kind of have to let them evolve at their own pace and their own time and so I like to look at parenting more as raising kids who are self-reliant and resilient and, and a lot of that comes from helping them develop good problem solving skills and good coping mechanisms. Yeah. So if you kind of buy into that, then all of a sudden, everything that we want to make happen, that we want to fix, all of a sudden come these, become these opportunities for our kids to develop problem solving skills and to develop coping mechanisms and ultimately become more self-reliant and resilient. Yes, that's so good. So um, why do you think that we do that? As we're talking kind of big picture, why do we think that we need to engineer how our kids turn out? Which isn't something that other generations of parents did necessarily. Um, and you know, I'm in the middle of reading a book called The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt, which I strongly recommend. Um, and he talks about how there was this big shift in higher education and you know the more people that started to get college degrees the more competition that there was and then everyone needed to you know start their kids earlier get the leg up and you know for this fear that if i don't do this now my child's going to be a left behind or not be as successful and, you know, I think that's 
kind of where it came from. Yeah. Not, so there not isn't enough thing. pressure on us anyway, right? As parents, we yeah. put all this pressure on ourselves and then we have that layer on top. Yeah. And right. then, you know, it also happens in the schools. You know, what I was learning from this book is that, you know, it used to be that, you know, a kindergarten education, you, you know, was socializing and, you know, very play oriented mm -hmm. with a little learning the alphabet and the numbers and a few things like that and now it's you know expecting to be reading a little bit when you're done like it's very become very academic yeah. and a lot of the play has been significantly reduced mm -hmm. and so one of my theories is and that's the name of this podcast right is that if we believe that we are a good mom then we can just do whatever we want <laughs> instead of like the long list of expectations that we put on ourselves to qualify as a good mom. And so I think that this kind of is included in that where we put all this pressure on ourselves that if our kid is, like you said, left behind or doesn't read in kindergarten, then that reflects on us. Right. Yeah. And, so and then we we're... also get that fear. Mm -hmm. it, it gives us a lot of fear because we're projecting all of that on our kids as adults. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one thing that's fun is your book is called Parenting with Sanity and Joy, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> and, and so I have, I have just a little freebie that I like to give away. That's like the four secrets to sanity. <laughs> and my, my number one secret is there's no mommy report card is what I call it meaning your kid's behavior does not reflect on you as a mom, you know? So as we're so stressed about their report cards, it's because we think it's reflecting on our report card as the mom, right? And so we can drop that whole lie in our brains by just believing that we are a good mom, that our kids are good kids. And now what do we want to do? Do we want to teach them to read in preschool or do we want to just play with them? If it doesn't matter either way in order to qualify as a good mom, then we can be the kind of mom that we already are. We just can't even figure out who she is because she's too busy trying to like conform to all of this pressure from society. Does yeah. And, sense? and, you know, by the way, that pressure from society is not proving to be good for our kids. Yeah. So if we can tell ourselves it's better for our kids to be outside playing mm -hmm. as opposed to working with a tutor learning to read at an age where they really don't need to because everyone will read, um, mm -hmm. that we're all going to be better off. Like if we can really take a lot of the pressure off ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and honestly, to me, like being a good mom. If your kids know that they're loved by you and that they feel your care and love and support, you're a good mom. Yeah. Like all the other stuff doesn't matter. If your kid's hair isn't brushed mm -hmm. or, you know, or they, <laughs> they, they go to school in pajamas, like, <laughs> honestly, it doesn't matter. Yeah. In fact, you know, it's totally fine. And, you know, other parents are going to look at that and, you know, one of the tips in my book, because it's just a bunch of tips is, you know, ignore the judgy parent. Yeah. And I'm sure that those judgy parents are thinking, oh, I need to be like that. You know, I need to just let go and let my kid go to school in pajamas, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, and for me, letting your kid go to school in pajamas may be embarrassing for them. And that is okay. And because the next day want. they probably won't want to wear pajamas. But, you know, you were talking earlier about, you know, the hassles of the morning, getting your kids all off to school and, you know, that you've just been through the tornado of all of that. You know, and one of, one of the things that we can do, and I, I feel so strongly about this, is, is narrow down our goals. Mm -hmm. right so what's your goal in the morning right the ultimate goal is to get your kids out of the house and to school on time yeah right mm -hmm. and if that's your goal that's all you get you don't get kids dressed kids teeth brushed kids fed none of that 
if that happens, great. If it doesn't, that's also okay. If your kids don't eat breakfast, sting at the table, that's okay. Have a little snack for them. Have a little grab and go thing to just throw in their backpack or to hand them as they're walking out the door or, or getting in the car with you, however they get to school. Mm -hmm. Say, oh, you know, I know she didn't have breakfast here. Take take this in case you're hungry. Yeah. Like the fighting of hurry up, sit down, take three more bites, mm -hmm. get your shoes. Like mm -hmm. all of that is unnecessary, you know? And honestly, like, it's not easy to just turn a, you know, flip a switch and be like that. But you know what? You sit down with your kids and say, hey, you know what? This is the deal. This is what, you know, I don't want to be yelling. I don't want to be stressing out. I don't want to stress you out in the morning. That's not a good way for any of us to start our day. Yeah. So we're going to narrow this down and we're going to simplify the morning. And you work through it like that. Yeah. You, know, you can also like get your kids to be more responsible for the things that they need to do, you know, and there's a way to do that. And I, you know, I work through that, Yeah. you know, so, so you can learn, teach your kids how to do it, but it is possible. And then all of a sudden, like our mornings are better. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not a bad mom if you don't, if your kids don't eat breakfast. Right. And you know, you're not a bad you... mom if you did get stressed out and you did yell at them. And, you know, and as we beat ourselves up, calling ourselves a bad mom for however it turned out this morning, then it's just more likely to be the same or worse tomorrow. So, yeah. That's... And it's not, I don't think it's ever like a bad mom. You know, I think it was, I was a stressed mom. Yeah. And I don't want to feel stressed because it's not good for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm going to work on that because I'll feel better. Yeah, exactly. So that's what we were talking about before we hit record is that there's all the tips and tricks and tools and hacks and things that like are so fun to learn about, right? Oh, cool. I'm going to try this new thing to try to make the morning routine go more smooth. But if the mom is not <laughs> regulated in the first place, then whatever new strategy you think you're going to try to use is going to fall flat. Um, so you and I both, we really want to support the mom for her own mental and emotional resilience mm -hmm. in order to try anything new. So as you were talking about those judgy parents, like, yeah, we can try to kind of, you know, manage our minds about not being worried about the judgy parents. But really, if we're worried about other people judging us, it's because we have a judgy parent in our own head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? yeah. And so it's the own, our own voices in our own head that are judging ourselves that I'm always, you know, focused on trying to help the moms I think quiet that voice a little bit. I, I think so much of it, rather than the hacks and all that little tidbits of great information yeah. is really about perspective mm -hmm. and you know it, it it's going to take really kind of changing your perspective about your own expectations of yourself as a parent in order to get to that place and that's okay. why like I like to say that you know everything that you want to jump at you know, everything you're questioning about yourself, or I didn't do this right, or I didn't do that, or whatever, think to yourself, because I didn't, or because I don't want to, or because I'm going to allow this to happen to my child, which is going to make me more relaxed, so I don't have to fix everything. Mm -hmm. Is this preventing my child? If I didn't do it, would it prevent my child from becoming resilient? Yeah. Right? Is this going to, will this help my child to develop problem solving skills? Will this help my child to create, get more coping mechanisms, yeah. you know? And then you're like, oh yeah, it will. Okay, good. This is good. Yeah, This is good. My kid forgets something and I nagged them about it and said, you know, 20 times, don't forget to put this in your backpack, put it in your backpack. Did you put it in your backpack? Da, 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 da. You know, mm -hmm. which is also not a fun thing to do as a parent. You know, so you can stop doing that. And if your kid forgets a thing, what happens? 
you know, like, yeah, I always did like, okay, someone will come to me and say, well, da, 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 and I'm just like, yeah, okay. And then if that happens, then what? And then what? And then what? And then what? And it's really never bad. You know, it's like, we just create these scenarios in our heads that are, are causing us so much stress. Yeah. Like, oh my God, if my kid doesn't have their homework today at school, what's going to happen? Right? Well, if there's a consequence, great. Mm -hmm. This teaches our kids something. It will teach them to become more self-reliant. It will teach them to try to remember. Maybe we jump in and we say, hey, I noticed you forgot your homework for the third day in a row. What can you do? Let's come up with some ideas so that you can remember to bring your homework. And you, come, you start brainstorming ideas. And then you say, which one do you want to try first? Right? And when you say to your kids, what do you want to try first? You're teaching them about trial and error. Yeah. And you know what's so great about that? Is there's no judgment in trial and error. It, you, almost, you expect that something's not going to work right. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to go back and you either start all over again or you tweak or whatever. And maybe it takes a couple of different times. And so we're not, we're not fighting with our kids. We're not barking at them. We're helping them learn a skill. Yeah. Just like, you know, I remember it was like that ferberizing our babies. We were teaching them to learn a skill to sleep by them, go back to sleep by themselves. Right. And you know, maybe we felt terrible because we allowed our child to cry and be uncomfortable, but it's okay. And it's okay. To yeah. So as you're talking about this, I have like a thousand examples in my head of, um, I love this framework where we're focused on problem solving and coping mechanisms instead of tasks getting done. Right. Cause I think that yes. we tend to be very task oriented. Like their water bottles need to be filled up and they need to eat and they need to get their backpacks and charge their Chromebooks and da, da, da. like there's a big long list of tasks that need to be done and it all needs to be done by a certain time. And so it's like, if they're not going to do it, I've just got to do it. And so we're just running around doing tasks all day long. It's just tasks. And when we focus on relationship instead of task, or we focus on learning instead of checking boxes, right. Then, mm -hmm. um, then we can think more like, well, they're old enough to tell time now. Like maybe I can teach them that at this particular time, this task should be done. And then they can be responsible for that instead of we're responsible for that. So we're teaching them problem solving skills instead of solving all their problems for them. All we're just doing it and all day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you know what? Yeah. Is it harder initially to do that? Absolutely. Is it just easier to just fill up the water bottles for mm -hmm. sure. But ultimately it really pays off. Yeah. And again, it all comes back to if we're regulated in the first place, because <laughs> if I'm pitching a fit, yeah. like how come you guys never put your stuff away? Like I love your Ohio trick. So Ohio is an acronym yeah. <laughs> for, um, Oh shoot. I lost it. Tell me what it stands for. Only handle it yeah. once. Yeah. <laughs> So I yeah. love that. Cause when I go to the grocery store, I literally count how many times I touch an item and I've, mm -hmm. it's like six times or something. You pick it up out of the shelf, you put it in your basket, you take it out of your basket, put it on the thing. And if you check out yourself, you touch it again. And then, and then you put it in the back and then you touch. And I'm like, that is so much. Like, I don't even shop. I just do a <laughs> Sam's club pickup. Somebody else is putting it in my car. I do one. <laughs> like I take it from my car into my house. That's, That's great. It's like, if you slow down every task like that is like, and I, and I watch my kids do it. Like they just open their whatever and throw the thing on the floor. I'm like, if you threw it straight into the garbage, that'd be one less thing to do later for me, you know? <laughs> and, um, well, yeah, it's sort of like, but instead of having to say, can you pick that up and put it in the garbage? You just say, Ohio. Yeah. You have a it's fun like little code word. Code words. You know, I'm like so big on code words yeah. that it's a great way to remind your child about certain things. Or, you know, if you have a child who's interrupting all the time, mm -hmm. you have a code word about that instead of like scolding. Yeah. It's like a sweet, kind 
reminder and no one gets offended and you know it puts a smile on your face so it helps that also yeah instead of what I tend to do how come nobody can clean up after themselves and I because the fits that I'm pitching in my head all come straight out my mouth like I have no filter you know (laughs) and so that's why I'm so big on like cleaning up our thoughts because a lot of people have a better filter than me but their head is still going right and so maybe they're not saying all of the things to their kid mm -hmm. but they're still thinking it and that's affecting their relationship and how they're feeling towards their kid you know and about themselves yeah for sure so you know and just you know people may think oh yeah I'm just gonna say Ohio but the trick is your kid needs to know where that thing goes so everything has to have a place so if your kid throws their coat on the floor do they know where the hook is to hang their coat you know is there a specific one just for them you know and if you can do that and can they reach it easily and is it you know nearby like this simplifies the things but have them know and maybe you play the game with Ohio like and you say okay let do it with a bunch of different things mm-hmm. and say okay where does that go let's do that like almost like a scavenger hunt like yeah. and they'll get into it and they'll probably start reminding you about it as well right <laughs> throw a shirt on the floor Ohio mom yeah and I was exactly. just thinking we can like point out on my map back here where Ohio is you know yeah. even Ohio has a place that's its yeah. place. I like that <laughs> That's anyway. a great idea. Okay, Sue, anything else you want to leave our listeners with last little nugget of wisdom before? Yeah, we... I do because I think this one's really important too. And that's what I call normalizing uncomfortable emotions mm, so that we have a really hard time when our kids are uncomfortable. And I mean by that disappointed, frustrated, sad, worried, anxious, angry, all these like really normal, healthy human emotions. And it's really hard for us when we see our kids like that, because then we're like, wait, my kid can't be like that. They need to be happy. Hmm. And of course, when they're happy, I'm happy. But if we can remove ourselves from those emotions and say, again, this is back to developing coping mechanisms for feeling that way. You know, it's not like suck it up. It's, it's okay. I don't blame you for being disappointed that you didn't get invited to that birthday party. When I don't get invited to something that I want to go to, I get disappointed too. Mm -hmm. It's really normal. And you give them a hug and say, I get it. That's not easy. It feels crummy to feel, be disappointed like this. And that's it. And we don't then say, but don't worry, we're going to do something really fun on that day, you know, because then you're fixing it for them. Let them get through it. And if it's difficult, that's okay. Remember your first breakup sucked, right? The second breakup was a little bit better. And we started to learn we'll get through it, Mm -hmm. right? We can handle it. So at the end of the day, don't we want to know that rather than I just want my kids to be happy, mm-hmm. that I know that my kids can handle being unhappy. Exactly. My kids can handle being frustrated or disappointed or concerned. And, you know, I used to say to my kids when they were little, you know, my kid would be worried about something like, don't worry, honey, it'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Or Don't be sad. It's okay. And it was like, what was I saying? Yeah. Why was I saying that? You know, mm-hmm. like uh, instead yeah, I don't blame you for being worried because you're going to do something that you've never done before. You're going to a situation. You don't know what that's like. You're going to be with kids you haven't met before. Like whatever, adults feel that too. Mm -hmm. And also you don't have to hide your own emotions from your kids. You don't always have to be happy mommy. Yeah. Because that's not normal. Mm -hmm. We need to model for our kids how we experience those feelings and show them that they go, we get through it. Yeah. We may have to be that way for a little while, but I know, like, I know I'll get through it. I know my kids now they're 23 and 25. So they're very capable at getting through it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like, then all of a sudden, like you as a parent don't feel so stressed out, like that your kid feels that way. Yeah. And it does take practice, 
But once you see, once you do it, and then you do it again and again, it gets easier and easier. And then it's like this huge weight has been lifted off your shoulders. And I remember the first time I did it and I was like, oh my God, that was amazing. I don't care that my kid feels that way because this is so good for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So good. So I actually, I do um, a support group call for my, my moms that have kids with type one diabetes, our T1D moms Mm -hmm. group. And this is what we talked about yesterday, actually, because it's kind of like you said, it takes practice. And so my mantra that I say all the time is emotions are not a problem that need to be fixed. And so that kind of just in my mind Mm -hmm. sums up everything you just said, you know, my emotions, their emotions, everyone's emotions, it's just feelings and it's fine. You know, that's right. another one. It's just feelings and it's yeah. fine. <laughs> and, um, and so when we remember that, then like you said, they get their full human experience instead of this like blunted, weird, like why it, it, that's also the first principle I always teach in mental and emotional resilience is to think like, what is our emotional goal here? Like we started at the beginning, you know, the big picture, what is our goal of parenting? What is our goal emotionally? Because we subconsciously have this goal that we all need to be happy all the time. And that's affecting us all day. Mm -hmm. And so when we get the awareness that that's even in our heads, then we can reprogram that and be like, oh, wait, happiness is not the goal here. Feeling all the human emotions and having a full, rich human experience is the goal here. Not And support and supporting supporting our kids in that way and so that when they come home from school and they didn't have that thing that they needed it's not like when they complain about it we don't say well I told you to put it in your backpack a hundred times yeah we say well you know I noticed that and tell me how you handled it Mm because I saw that and I thought oh I know they'll be able to do that they'll be able to deal with it right we're we're building them up that way, empowering them to be able to handle it. Or, you know, sometimes you say, okay, well, that didn't go well. What do you think you might do differently next time? Yeah. Instead yeah. of us wanting to jump in, well, maybe you should have done this, or why didn't you do that? Or da, 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 da. In a love, coming from a loving place. Yeah. But our kids hear it as judgment. Yeah. And again, the reason we say that to them is because we're saying it to ourselves too, in our own heads. So it's this, you know, two sides of the same coin, whichever one you want to work on first. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. All right. See, this has been so fun. Thanks so much for coming. Um, Do you want to share where people can find you? Yeah, sure. Um, So my website is theparentingmentor.com. You can find my podcast there, which is called the Parenting Mentor Sessions, which a parent comes on and talks about a current challenge and I help work them through it with perspective and strategies. If anybody listening would like to be on it, just reach out to me. Um, You can reach out through my website. You can DM me on Instagram, which is at the Parenting Mentor, same with TikTok at the parenting mentor. And I, of course I do private sessions. I work with companies and small groups. So, awesome. so I'm awesome. all over. <laughs> That's so great. Okay. Well, we appreciate your time and we'll see you later. Great. Thanks so much, Emily.